I'm Maria Shemkalian, and I'm excited to introduce our guest today, Stephen C. Miller. Thank you so much for joining us. And Stephen has worked on so many fantastic films, and I'm sure you've seen Silent Night in the headlines <laughs> right now, <laughs> very relevant. And also there is First Kill and Line of Duty and a lot of other amazing movies with some of the A-level talent. And I look forward to learning how you got where you are and really appreciate you taking time to share and to, to guide us on Yeah, getting... no problem. Thank you so much. So the first question is always, how did you get started in this competitive industry? Uh, you know, for me, I grew up in uh, Florida. Uh, so I was really far away uh, from the industry. Uh, I just knew that I love movies. Um, and I knew I wanted to be involved somehow. Uh, so th the only logical place for me to start was I was doing music videos mm -hmm. uh, and I did a lot of skate videos um, and really just kind of honed my skills with those kind of, you know, places and, and really traveling and, and understanding how to use a camera and how to edit. Uh, I really wanted to learn all of those things uh, very early on. Uh, and then it quickly became, well, maybe I should try a film school um, so I found a film school in Florida called Full Sail, uh, and I really loved that school because they were very technical. Uh, and like I said, I really wanted to be hands-on with the camera. I wanted to be hands-on with the editing equipment. Uh, I really wanted to understand how all of that stuff worked because I felt like if I knew how all of that stuff worked, it was just going to make me a better director on set uh, and dealing with with all of the issues that come on set. So uh, while in film school. I met a few guys, uh, in particular, William Clevenger and Mark Thalman, who uh, we started discussing about trying to make our own movie. Uh, and we went about that by uh, talking to the people in our school and asking if we could rent their equipment. Um, and they allowed us to use their equipment, uh, but they only gave us a nine day window mm -hmm. uh, to use the equipment. So we specifically tailored a script that we wrote for those nine days uh, and that was my feature film debut, which was Automaton Transfusion. Mm -hmm. um, and I took that, that movie and the rest of the money I had left from making the movie, which I had used some of my student loan money uh, to make the movie, which is around $6,000. And so we made the movie. Uh, I took the movie. I drove it out to Los Angeles. Um, I basically slept in my car for the next year and a half, uh, editing the movie, getting the movie scored, getting the movie uh, mixed um, and did all of that from favors uh, randomly, either off Craigslist or meeting people uh, who were willing to give back their time because they felt strongly about this little, you know, what I was calling a student film at the time. Um, and then, uh, you know, as, as luck would have it, I was able to run into the right people um, and it got into the right hands. And the next thing you know, it was playing at Screamfest um, where it was then under sort of like a bidding war uh, between Lionsgate and Dimension and uh, uh, Ghost House at the time. Uh, and it ended up being bought by Dimension and uh, uh, Dimension Extreme. Uh, so um, that was my first film that I ever tried making and, and I was lucky enough to sell that to a studio. Uh, and then from there, it was just sort of like a, a whirlwind of, you know, I just started uh, making everything inside it feels like. <laughs> That's really amazing. This is this is exactly what we're looking for. Just when hard work pays off, hard work and right. commitment. Networking is a very common theme in uh, almost all of our master classes. Uh, right. Everybody has a secret on effective yep. for to effective networking. Uh, do you mind sharing yours? Some some networking tools that you found effective. Yeah, you know, I, I found that it being being very grounded is effective um, and, and not charging in on someone with what they can do for you mm -hmm. right off the bat is a huge advantage. I think if you treat people um, with respect and also approaching them about their art first, especially if you're going to someone about networking, if you're you know another director trying to reach out to a director or an actor reaching out to an actor or happen to run into one, you know, I, I think the scariest thing you can do right away is say, well, I do that and I, you know, and blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I think it, it, it's always great when you start the conversation out like a human being uh, and which is that you're just a fan, you know, you love their work and, and then and then really kind of moving it to 
what, you know, look, I, I enjoy this. And is there a way that I can figure out to do something with you? Uh, I think there's ways to go about it. But, you know, another one of my strategies when I got out to LA, a big strategy for me, and it sounds crazy, but I, I picked out the studios like the Paramounts and the Warner Brothers uh, and the Sony lots. And I purposely went to bars that were the closest to these lots because I figured that all of these people working in these studios have to filter out and where do the most of our industry people like to go, but it's probably a bar to let, let loose and hang out for a second. And, and that proved to be very uh, fruitful for me. Um, that's where I met a lot of contacts. Uh, in fact, it's where I met uh, Brad Miska who, who runs bloodydisgusting.com who eventually took my movie to, to the film festival to where it got shown. So I, I've met tons of people there. I mean, I met one of the uh, guards from the Sony lot who let me run onto the Sony lot and drop my trailer off on a few few places and ended up getting into Sam Raimi's hands on the Sony lot. So there, it, there's been plenty of instances that I've sort of uh, weaseled my way into things because I've put myself in the right positions. And I think when you think about networking, you have to really think about you putting yourself out there um, and putting yourself in those positions for networking to work. I mean, networking isn't just like you sitting back and like hoping people chat with you or, or hitting them up, you know, via DM. You know, I think networking is a very personal experience. Uh, obviously, right now that's difficult, but uh, when when you can, I think it's a it's a great thing to do. Wow, that's beyond proactive. <laughs> I mean, it, it's proven effective, and that's amazing. Just finding how to be at the right place at the right time, and uh, right. not putting yourself first. So that, yep. that's that's a fantastic approach. Thank you. And what is the key to getting from where you were, uh, finding people in the bars who are in the right place in the, in the right time and, and pitching to everyone and befriending guards to already being where you are when people approach you and just ta-da. Yeah, I know. It's a, it's a bridge to cross. <laughs> it's a bridge and, it's, yeah. and it's, it's a time bridge. You mm -hmm. know, it is not something that happens overnight. And I think that's something that I should say right, about, right off the bat is like, you know, I made my first film in 2006. It didn't get bought till 2008. Mm. I didn't make my next movie till 2012. So, you know, and then in the time from 2012 to now I've made 12 movies. So, so it's just like a game of, it was really slow and trying to figure things out. And then it just rapidly took off. I think it's, uh, I think it's a lot of patience. Um, I, I think the old adage of uh, 10 years in LA is one year anywhere else. Uh, and that's sort of like, you know, what it takes for you to get somewhere out here. Uh, I think that 10 year mark is a cool sweet spot. I, I find that you're, you're really hitting your groove uh, after that 10 year mark here. Mm -hmm. And you just got to be able to create content. I mm -hmm. think you have to constantly be creating, whether it's low budget, no budget, mm -hmm. big budget. Uh, I, I think you should be creating at all times. So it helps that time feel like it's not stagnant. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that is what allows you to get better at what you're doing, honing your craft, um, but also uh, allows people to see what you do and how you do it well. Um, and I think that's part of it is just creating. Do you think directors should stick to one genre or? No. Okay. No, I, I really enjoy directors that bounce around because I think it's, of course, I think when you're in a genre, you sort of get in a groove and you, and mm -hmm. you get really great at it and you can hone your craft. But I think for me, uh, I found that bouncing from horror uh, to action was a lot of fun. Um, it allowed me to express myself in a different way, but it also allowed me to take things that I loved about horror and introduce them into an action world that's not supposed to have those sort of elements in it. And, and uh, it, it really makes it a, a different sort of feel and kind of brings your style to where you want it to be. But, you know, look, I, I also don't think it's terrible. If you're a guy that loves, uh, that loves action or horror or comedy or drama, that's just what you want to do. I mean, go for it. But I do feel like stepping outside your comfort zone and trying other things is a good thing. And if that trying that makes you love what you did even more, then fine, go back. But there's no harm in trying uh, something else, especially when you're first starting out. What about TV world versus feature world? Uh, do you think directors should go in between or just stick? 100%. To I, I don't think there is that anymore. You know, I, I feel like features and in, in television or streaming is all starting to mesh together. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, um, you know, just by today's announcement of Warner Brothers deciding that they're going to put their entire 2021 slate through HBO Max. I mean, that's insane. I mean, that's 
every tentpole movie they have of Matrix Four, you know, to what to Dune. Uh, so it, it's just to me, it's all blurred lines now. I think it's becoming uh, where you're not going to have you're the feature director and you're the television director or you're the streaming director. I think they're just looking for directors or content creators that are able to cross mediums and tell a story. And I think that's what's really cool about this to me is that it's not about whether or not you're a feature or a film or or studio or or low budget or TV director. You, you're just a creator. And if you can tell a story, that's what people want. And, and I really love that about what's happening now is that it really is about can you tell a story or not? And that's what should it, that's what it should be about. In regards to uh, choosing material, now uh, when you work with screenwriters, how do you choose the material that you believe will prove to be successful? Well, you know, I, I read a lot. Um, and so it's sort of just an, an, the idea of narrowing down what I find to be exciting um, and sort of uh, tapping into what I know I do best. Mm -hmm. um, and I think very early on in my career, uh, I was sort of saying yes to everything. And, and that was sort of because I didn't really know exactly where I was. I, did I want to be in horror? Did I want to be in action? Did I want to do, what did I want to do? So I sort of put myself in a position to say yes to everything and, and really just sort of do a uh, bigger level version of film school and make everything. Um, and I did that. And then, you know, over the course of the past two years, I've really decided to sort of slow down and really start being more picky with what I'm choosing uh, and that really comes down to screenwriters as far as, you know, I really look for screenwriters that are very vivid on the page um, and that have a style of writing that's not so typical. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a fan of uh, different styles of writing. It's not just the typical uh, A to B. Um, I like writing that sort of pops off and, and gives me some, uh, some sort of feel about their, their flavor and their vibe uh, as a writer and not just uh, writing it for the screenplay, uh, you know, per the rules of screenplay writing. Um, I enjoy reading people that really sort of try to step outside that box. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And from the director's point of view, what uh, are some differences between working for a studio and working for an independent production? <laughs> Well, I mean, an independent production is different in the sense that it's just, it's, it all feels the same. It's just less toys, you know, like an independent production is, is you're not getting as many of the, the bigger toys that you would like with camera equipment wise, you're only working with certain things. Um, but I find the creative process to be almost exactly the same. I think for me, it doesn't really change other than I get to ask for a techno crane some days on my bigger films. And if, when I was doing indie films, it was just handheld all the time, all day long, right? If we got a dolly, we were lucky. And so our steady cam, oh my God, we were really lucky. So um, for me, I just looked at it as indie, in the indie world, it, it really forces me to tell a story a very distinct way um, because I'm limited to what I can use to tell that story. So I really hone in on how I tell that story with those limitations in mind and not try to get too big and thinking I need to have this, this or this, knowing I can't get that. And so I don't want to disappoint myself. So I think that's what's crucial about working in the indie space is really understanding what you can do with what you have and, and understanding how to use that to your advantage. Mm -hmm. You brought up... Uh getting big on set and, and asking for a lot. How do you stay budget conscious while staying true to your vision? You know, that's always the difficult part is balancing budget and vision because the studio and the uh, line producers <clears throat> have a very different idea of what they need to get done, which is the bottom line. And your idea is, but I need this shot and I need this to be able to tell the story of the shot. Uh, and so uh, it really comes down to sort of nickel and not nickel and diming. It, it really comes down to uh, picking your battles. And I like what I like to call is like, I know going into a movie that I'm going to fight for three or four big things. And that means other things I just need to let go. Right. And, and it's whether or not it's like, well, you can't have a steady cam for five days. If you're going to want this techno crane for one, you're going to get a steady cam for two days, you know? So you really just have to go in knowing I need these for these three or four shots or scenes uh, or days and know that's what you're fighting for and be willing to sacrifice other things to get those big things. And I think that is how I go about it. And being budget conscious is being okay with sacrificing the smaller things as long as I get the big, um, big vision pieces that I know are going to make the movie or the trailer moments 
of the movie that I need, uh, that those are the ones I'm going to fight for. In regards to decision making, uh, when uh, especially when it's so subjective and you look at the script and there are so many ways that it could go, and many of them sound perfect at a time, yeah. how do you choose the best way to go and don't feel cognitive dissonance afterwards? Uh I'm very decisive, oddly enough. I, I just do it. I, I, I go with my first instinct. I never, I never think about it again uh, because the more I dwell on it, I think the more I would feel like, oh, maybe I made the wrong choice. <laughs> but I, I just do whatever I feel instinctually is the right choice and I don't look back and I just continue forward. And uh, I'm also very open to ideas. Uh, if there's something I'm battling with where I'm like, man, I like this, but I like this. Then that's something I go to my DP, I go to my production designer, I go to my producer and I say, hey, guys, I, you know, this could go either way. I like both of these things. What do you think? And I think for me, best ideas always win and they should always win on set because you're just trying to make the best movie. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I look at movies as very collaborative uh, and I look to everyone to sort of say, hey, are you feeling this? You know, do you feel like this is working, uh, especially for the actors? Uh, is this working and, and how we're blocking and how we're rolling? Uh, do you feel it and do you want to do it a different way? I think, you know, I, I'm always open to those sort of challenges. Mm -hmm. Being such a hands-on director, uh, how do you delegate tasks effectively? Yeah, I think that's, that's a really interesting question. I, for me, like I really do trust my team when I'm on set. Um, you know, you really have to trust your first AD to keep you moving. You got to trust the DP that you've all of the prep you've been doing for three months, that he's got that so ingrained into his brain that it's just sort of like flowing like clockwork. Um, when it comes to production designing, I am very hands on, but I think those are the most creative people on the planet. Uh, and I love hearing what they have to say or do. So I trust them immensely. Um, and I think you just, there's, yes, there's a sense of having a lot of control, but then there's a sense of also relief when you can sort of let that go a little bit and let your team do what they're there to do. Uh, and I think that's a sort of a balance that you would learn, uh, through directing a few features that you learn where to kind of keep your claws and where to let go. Uh, it's the same with actors and letting them do their thing versus controlling where they're moving and how they're saying it. You know, there's a lot of that, like, you know, learning that you need to let them do their thing. Uh, and that's what's going to make the best content. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> what helps an effective collaboration with the director of photography? Oh, man, I think it's, it's, it's a very intimate thing between a director and a DP. Um, they're talking a very cinematic language. And I think that's really what it is. It's a cinematic language. I mean, you should be able to talk to your DP in a very cinematic aspect in the sense that I know when I talk to my DP, uh, I'm saying, you remember that one shot in Alien where he jumps and does this and he's going, yeah, I got it. I know exactly what you're thinking. Uh, let's go with that. And so that's what I love about my DPs and, and dealing with them is that I feel like I have a connection with them on a cinema level, uh, not just a friend level or a business relationship level, but I think it has to be a cinema level. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get on set, and you're going to have very different ideas of what you want to make. And that's just going to be a big problem. So uh, I think having that cinematic language and understanding that uh, they get you and they get what you're trying to make is a big deal. Um, and for me, I also really understand the camera. I understand the language that a DP is saying and, and talking. And I feel like that is a big deal for directors. Uh, I think directors should understand camera. They should understand what the lenses on that camera do. They should understand what the focal length is. They should understand all of this. Yeah, I think, like I said, I think it's just talking in a very cinematic language. I think once you understand that, then you can really understand what they do and, and understanding all of the camera and what the camera does, the camera lens, all of that stuff is a huge deal. Um, because when you talk to them, you just want them to know that you're on their level mm -hmm. and that you understand how those things work and where they're going to be, when they're going to be. It just really helps make you a more effective leader. Mm -hmm. When you are looking through auditions, I'm not sure whether you participate mm -hmm. in person or you just look through the recorded castings, but when you do, what makes an actor stand out? Besides yeah, I do both. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I, I do both. I, as much as I can be in the room, mm -hmm. I try to be in the room because videotape is so difficult. Yeah. 
yes. or FaceTime is so difficult. Uh, being in the room, you really get a chance to uh, understand someone's aura and, and what they're kind of bringing to the table. And it's really hard watching someone cold read, uh, just getting a video of all, you know, 30 people reading. Um, but there is a few things for me that always stand out. It's, I mean, confidence is one of them. Uh, and I think that's sort of just how they enter the room, um, how they interact in the room. Are they gracious in the room? Um, I appreciate actors that uh, feel like they want to be there. <laughs> uh, I know that sounds silly, but you, you get a lot of actors that just walk in and it's like the fourth one they've done that day. And I realize that and it's extremely difficult. Um, but if it if I feel like you're, this is the fourth one of the day, that means there's something wrong. You know what I mean? I should feel like this is your first one and you're excited about it. And I, and I realize that's difficult to do uh, when, you're, when you're going to so many, but I think you sort of have to tap into that. Hey, look, this is something that I really love. Uh, and I have to show that on screen. And so that is one thing that I really look for is, is how, they, how they walk into the room. How do they carry themselves? And because that's really how they're gonna carry themselves on set. And, you know, for me, my sets are very light and fun. Uh, I am not a yeller. I don't really dig that kind of style. I just like to have fun on my films. And so I really look for actors that are going to sort of complement my directing style. Uh, and you can have an actor do a great performance, but if we aren't getting along on set, I think that sort of bleeds into the movie. Uh, and so I think it starts from the audition. And if we're getting along and vibing in the audition before even lines are being read or spoke, uh, that's a huge win for me. Um, and so um, then when they're delivering their lines, I think it's just all about direction and can they take direction? I mean, I'm looking for that instantaneously is how well do they take direction? Um, do they need a lot of direction? Uh, and, and a lot of that is because a lot of my films are shot pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're talking under 25 days. And so I don't have a lot of time to do eight and nine, 10 takes of things. Uh, I like to kind of keep it under five because I like to keep it quick and people moving. I also think it keeps the acting fresh. <clears throat> so I think for me, like it really is about how well do they take direction and how quickly can they pull that direction off? Uh, so those are, those are some things that I really look for immediately when I'm casting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What helps with an effective uh relationship with actors on set what makes uh, you want to book them again <laughs> yeah for me for me it's just their persona on set i i look at this i look at the actors as as leaders on set mm -hmm. uh not not just myself but i look for the actors for that too especially the older actors the 10-year actors who've been in, doing it a long time i really look for them to sort of control it a little bit mm -hmm. um and and sort of uh take control and and look control and and have sort of a, a an alpha presence, I guess, as to the to the younger actors to really help them. Sometimes I get actors on set who haven't done a lot. Mm -hmm. And so it's really great when the older actors who have really more experienced, um, not even older, just more experienced, yeah. are able to kind of show them the ropes. Um, and so I really look for that kind of stuff because I feel like that's something that encourages me and it helps me move the movie better. And so, you know, it's always a reason why you want to hire people again. Mm -hmm. How do you get to the point when name actors are ready to consider your films? Well, I mean, that's difficult because it's like you, you always, you almost need one to like you. Uh, and then they sort of like spread the word that this guy's great. And then it becomes a lot easier. So getting that first one is the most difficult in my opinion. And for me, it was Bruce Willis. Mm -hmm. It was like dealing with Bruce for the first time and, and getting to get Bruce for the first time. I really leaned on the producers to make that happen um, in the mm -hmm. studio. And so, um, but you know, there was a call involved in me meeting with Bruce. Um, and so that was the first time that I was able to do that. Um, but once I was able to do that with Bruce, then it sort of became a little more natural and a little bit easier because from there it was like, okay, the studio trusted me with Bruce. Now they would bring other guys in for me to deal with. Editing and post-production. Again, so many ways that you can go with editing, especially when you have a few really fantastic cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you, do you just trust the editor or are you very hands-on in the editing room too? I don't wanna say I don't trust the editor, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm a maniac when it comes to being hands-on with the mm -hmm. edit. Um, I have a very specific way I shot the movie that translates into a very specific way I want the movie edited. So I have to have an editor that really trusts me <laughs> and understands that I know what I want uh, and I do give them the first kind of freedom to give a, a pass 
at the movie and then I come in and really hone it in. Um, and, um, then it becomes what that director's cut is, which is basically what I have finessed. And then we show it to the studio and then the studio will give all of their notes. And, and for me, I tend to, uh, really pack my director's cut with things I don't even want in there. Um, knowing that the studio will come in and give notes. And so a lot of the times they're picking out things that I don't want in there to throw away, which is good because I don't want them throwing away stuff I like. So, uh, you know, I sort of have little strategies here and there about how I show my films to either the producers or, or the studio in which is that I kind of bloat them uh, and make them a little bigger and, and have things in there that I don't necessarily want, just so that gives them something to sort of write a note about and, and tell me that that's not, you know, they don't know about that. And so uh, there's definitely some cool strategies when it comes to editing and how to get the movie you want. Yeah. Do you have advice in terms of film festivals? Because there's so many of them and it's so hard to choose. So yeah. what is your suggestion on going about it? Because they all cost I, money. They all cost money. And I think you have to really hone in on what your movie is. Um, obviously, if it's a horror film, I think you can kind of hone that in even more. <clears throat> and you can really find niche niche market uh, horror film festivals that are really fun. Like I said, the LA, film, uh, LA Scream Fest is one of my favorites. It's a really big one. South by Southwest is a huge for genre, all genres, really action or comedy, whatever. But South by Southwest is probably my favorite uh, film festival because mm -hmm. it's sort of right in the middle of the country. It's in Austin, Texas. It's not really difficult to get to. It's not too expensive uh, to uh, apply for or to submit. And uh, it's one of those that I feel like just has a lot of great people running it. And it has a lot of great industry people that love to go there and because it has great food, uh, but just because it, it's just a really fun atmosphere. And so for me, you know, I think film festivals are crucial for independent artists um, because I think that's where you not only get your movie seen if it happens to play, but I always encourage people just to be going, even if they don't have a film there because of the atmosphere and the people and who's in these bar settings and at these different parties or at these different events, uh, just going to the movies and who you randomly run into and meet is all about what this industry is, which is networking. And so uh, I don't think it always has to be about you having a movie there as much as it could easily be you and your friends taking a trip and just trying to make it a networking event. How do you deal with criticism? Uh, with reviews that <coughs> you know, pe people can be vicious <laughs> when they're oh, opinionated and it's hard because you love yeah. your craft and there are many who do and then there's one that says something and it just you know sets in there how do you fight it yeah like, I can't read them I, I just don't read them I, huh? I don't pay attention to them I don't I try not to of course they, they filter into your feed because mm -hmm. people like to tag you for it, even if it's yeah. negative, they, they love to tag you for the negative stuff. Why? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't get it. Um, but, you know, I always try to turn it into some kind of a positive. Um, you know, uh, I know when Ebert uh, had said something about one of my movies being a gore-tastic, like, you know, he said something gory mess. Uh, I was like, I'll take gory all day, dude. You know, and I tweeted at him and I said that and he loved it you know he he's been my friend ever since you know what I mean so there, there's things that you could do to say hey, look I get you didn't like it but I appreciate you watching I've gone that route several times and to be honest like I don't make movies uh for everyone to like that's not my job uh I, I make movies because I love making movies um and I I definitely want people to enjoy my product um but at the same time I understand my taste is very different um, than anybody's taste or everybody's taste is all different. So uh, I'm, I get that some people will love it and some people will hate it. And, uh, you know, I don't mind writing in that 50-50 line. Uh, I, I think that sort of makes my work more exciting. It's a very tough industry for family life uh, mm -hmm. with unpredicted hours, with a lot of traveling. So what is your guidance for parents in film to, to make it work? You, you really have to have a partnership with whoever you're with. I mean, if you're married uh, or a girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever it is, I, the partnership is so crucial with the kids, at least for me. Uh, you know, my wife is a crucial part of it, of what I do. Mm -hmm. um, she uh, is not only behind the scenes 
working on things that I'm doing, uh, but she's also a lot of the times taking care of what the kids are doing. And then we sort of trade off. Uh, I think it's a trade process. It's where we'll trade off where I'll, I'll do a movie and then I'm, I, I try to take, not take one for a few months um, and strictly be home and, and give her that time so she can do her thing and, uh, and work on what she's working on. So it's really a give and take and trying to try to find that balance. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of the times if I'm making a movie, they just come with me. Um, I enjoy having them there. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so, you know, for me, it's just like, if I can bring them, I do. Uh, and a lot of times that's in the summer. Um, and then, um, a lot of the times I try to work at home, especially after I'm done shooting, uh, the editing process, I do the editing process, uh, from my home office here, even if it's a studio movie with Lionsgate and the editors in Santa Monica or wherever, the great thing about technology is I can be anywhere and sit with like this. I can sit with the editor and we can go over the movie uh just like this i do that all the time and then um he does work and then i'm very hands-on so i like to have the the hard drive with me uh and i do work and so we sort of bounce things back and forth um so um yeah i mean it, it's a very delicate balance um but there's definitely a balance that you can figure out i, I don't think it's insanely difficult to have a family and still be in the industry. I think people do it all the time. I think it's just about trying to find something that works for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would you like them to follow your path, your kids? They already do. They already do, which is crazy. My, my daughter is, uh, she's 10 uh, and just went through Final Cut training. Uh, she loves Final Cut. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> my, my son, who's six, is very uh, hands-on with a camera. Uh, he loves it. Um, but my, my daughter is really the one that has really gravitated to the whole process, whether it's shooting and editing. Uh, acting really hasn't bit her. Uh, it's more of the behind the scenes process of, of doing the work. Um, and so uh, she is very clever. She's made a few trailers. She's made a few things where she's done all the editing herself. And, it, you know, it's pretty awesome to watch kids nowadays that have all of this at their fingertips Yeah. And they can just do it. And there's no need for me or you to show them. They just do it. And, and, and they know how uh, eventually they figure it out. So, yeah, it, it's definitely cool to see them uh, enjoying that part of what I do. Mm -hmm. What would be your three key pieces of advice or maybe some life lessons or maybe some mistakes that you have personally made that you can now suggest to avoid? Oh, to avoid. I think, you know, a big thing to avoid is when you're first getting out to LA is just getting in with wrong people. I mean, there's plenty of people out there that will tell you they can get you here, they can get you there. Uh, they have this project, they have that project, and 95% of it is wrong. <laughs> and, and so I think you have to be really conscious about who you let into your zone and who you allow to go out with your name attached to it. Um, and, and understanding that that person is representing you. If you don't know who that person is or what they've done and they're just kind of telling you and you're blanketly going off of it, you know, that's a huge mistake because there, there's way too many people trying to take advantage of people um, out here. Um, I think another mistake uh, that I made, a mistake I made early on was um, expecting things uh, to come to me right after I sold my first film. I thought, okay, well now it's just all going to start happening I can just sit back and let it happen and I think that was a you know a, it wasn't a critical mistake but it was a mistake because the, the, that's not how the industry works the industry keeps moving with or without you um, and so your first goal once you get into it and once you've gotten something sold or got something made is to keep pushing uh, and to keep getting yourself in the rooms and pushing to get other things made and once I realized that which was probably a year later everything started happening again because then I started pushing again. Um, but, you know, you sort of get a little complacent with once you land a manager and an agent, you sort of feel like, oh, they're just going to start bringing that stuff to me. And that's just not the case. Yeah. Uh, you really have to be on top of all of that daily. Mm -hmm. And I think the third thing to uh, really avoid it is, goes back to an, an agents and managers is do not make that your first priority in getting one when you first get here. I, I do not think that is something that filmmakers or actors should be necessarily looking for right off the bat. I think you need to be honing your craft and getting into things before you need to even start thinking about, do I need an agent? Do I need a manager? Do I need this person? Then you don't. 
Uh, and I don't think that is something that you should worry about right off the bat. And that's something I get asked a lot is how do, how do you get that? And I think the easy answer is, is that you don't, they find you. Um, and if, if you're, if you're going out and finding someone and they're, you know, telling you to pay some money, that's definitely wrong. <laughs> so, you know, so there's like, there's just so many different areas that that can go wrong that I think that's just something important to remember that it, it could just be you uh, until you need someone to help. But at the beginning, you really don't. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah. You brought up agents managers. Uh, do you have a few uh, maybe pieces of advice in choosing one? So when they do come to you, how, now that they've chosen you, how do you yeah. choose them? I think, I think, you know, it is, it's like once they start coming and sort of knocking on your door, uh, the best way for you to pick who you like is to hang out with them. That's it. And I, I, I know that I hung out with several. They're always willing to do dinners. They're always willing to do drinks. They're always, I mean, if they want you bad enough, they're, they're willing to take you out for a night. Um, and I encourage you to take advantage of that because it's fun uh, and, and make them, you know, spend a little money and have some fun and, and tell them why they think that they can help your career because that's the most important part is you, they work for you. Uh, and so they should be helping you get your career to where you want it to be. And I think that is ultimately the goal. And, you know, I was lucky enough that early on, I found a manager specifically who was willing to figure that out with me and ultimately became a really great friend and is still my manager to this day. But it, it really does start with someone that believes in you, uh, believes in your talent and, and expresses that to you. Um, you know, if there's someone that has sort of an, an, you know, a vague idea of what you're doing, or kind of gives you like a general speech. And I don't know if that's for you. I think you want someone that sort of dives in with, this is what we can do with your career and how we can make it flourish. Uh, and I'm going to be there for you. Uh, and I'm going to try to help you, you know, grow. So I think that's something that you have to really be looking for. And the only way you can find that out is by a hang session. I think if you can get a hang session out of it, that's, that's the best thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. To end this fantastic masterclass, uh, and we really appreciate it how just down to earth advice you're giving, really yeah, no going problem. from the very beginning to to where you are today. It's really great. It's it's a fantastic learning experience for those who are starting, and also we understand it's not an overnight success, but it just you know a lot of hard work and pushing on the right doors. So. Thank right. you for that. So to end this wonderful masterclass, whom would you like to nominate to send the elevator back down and also share words of guidance? It could be an established actor, filmmaker, you know, anyone. You know, I think I'd really love to nominate my DP, Brandon Cox, because I think director of photographies have so much insight mm -hmm. when it comes to filmmaking beyond how they deal with the directors. They also have to deal with the actors. And then they're also delegating with their crew. Mm -hmm. um, I think someone like that and having their experience on here would be very valuable. Absolutely. I, I would love to speak to him. Thank you for the nomination. Yeah. And thank you again, Stephen, for all this wonderful guidance. And I hope no that all of you who are watching... I hope that we see your films on big screens one day and on the top streaming platforms. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Steven. Bye. Thank you.